So today we're jumping in week number two of uh, back to John, back to John in week number two. Um, and as we're kind of processing this series, you, won't, you don't really need to be caught up with us. So if it's your first week here, you came to see somebody get baptized, the message should still make sense even outside of last week. But what we are doing with the gospel of John is jumping into the gospel and walking kind of verse by verse through what uh, the gospel of John tells us. If you weren't here last week, uh, John is a disciple of Jesus. So he's telling his firsthand account of what he's seen. And last week he sets Jesus up as everything, right? Word of God, uh, with God, and is God. So he's setting, setting Jesus up as everything. And today what we're going to talk about is how John perceives John the Baptist. Two different people, so if we, we try to keep them distinct. There's John the Baptist and then the disciple John who writes the gospel of John. So two different people, John the Baptist. And so we're going to see how John perceives John the Baptist. And then what, we've been, what we're going to do in the series is figure out knowledge, then application, right? How, how do, what is it saying in the scripture? And then how do I apply it to my life? Because that's what matters, right? It's one thing to know about Jesus. It's one thing to say you follow Jesus. It's another thing to live it out. To actually walk step in step with who Jesus has called you to be. And that's our challenge every day as fully devoted followers of Christ. All right, so we're going to look at John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. This is John the disciple talking about John the Baptist. It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, and that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Um, so, uh, there's, a, there's something that shows up in Scripture uh, where you repeat things in patterns of three. And you notice a word here that shows up three times, and that word is witness. That he is a witness, and he says it three times. John, in the Gospel of John, talking about John the Baptist, three times he says, John the Baptist is a witness. He is a witness. So his overarching description of who John the Baptist is, is he is a witness, right? Um, so who is John? Uh, let's give you a little backstory before we jump into more of John's story according to the Gospel of John. Uh, what we know from other Gospels is that John is baptizing in the wilderness. He's baptizing at the Jordan River, and um, he kind of seems like a crazy person. Okay? If we're honest, can we say that about uh, a father of the faith, a hero of the faith? He seems like a crazy person. Um, it says that he's, he dresses himself in camel's hair, and he's eating locusts and honey. That's crazy enough, right? That's all you need to know. You agree with me. You understand he seems like a crazy person. And he's out in the wilderness baptizing, and it seems like there's hordes of people that are following him to go get baptized. There's big groups of people that are following him to get baptized, and he's baptizing them, but it's just such a strange way to do it. It's confusing because it doesn't fit the current tradition. There's not really a tradition in, in John's day, in John the Baptist's day, to baptize people out in the wilderness, especially not to do it in mass. To like just make a bunch of people, hey, you get baptized, you get baptized, you get baptized. That doesn't really exist yet. That's not a thing. What John is doing is strange, but what, what they would have known is that there was a little bit of overlap. Like It's not like he just made up going fully under the water and coming out. There was a tradition, uh, and there was stuff in Scripture to talk about when you do that. Whenever you were uh, uh, unclean, there were certain things you touched or certain things you did in your life that made you unclean, you would go get baptized before you entered the temple. If you wanted to convert to Judaism, if you were at what's called in Scripture a Gentile, someone outside of the Jewish faith, not born into the bloodline of Judaism, then you would be able to convert. Scripture gave you an ability to convert in the Old Testament by being baptized. That was one of your steps to get baptized. But this idea of baptism is strange and unique, all right? So, so what does that mean for us is where we're getting, all right? We're talking about knowledge, a little bit of information. How do we apply that to our life? So John is doing something very strange, and it seems like John is very public, right? It, 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 John's, John's ministry is so public. Uh, John, uh, the, in the gospel of John, he doesn't even really intro what he's doing. I would argue that he doesn't really intro what John the Baptist is doing. It doesn't give a whole lot of backstory because the people he's originally writing to already know who John the Baptist is. That's how famous John is. At one point, we figure out that people think that Jesus might be the resurrected John. That's how famous John the Baptist is. He's doing something that is causing, creating all kinds of waves, creating all kinds of cool stuff. And all these people are following and want to get baptized. And of course, when you do stuff outside of the norm, when you do stuff that's like, eh, it doesn't fit the tradition, people have questions. And so that's what uh, we're going to step into in the Gospel of John chapter 1 is they send the priests and the Levites to ask John the Baptist, who are you? 
right? Have you ever, like, who, who do you think you are? Like, we're, we're the priests and the Levites. We do the baptizing around here. Who do you think you are out in the wilderness looking like a crazy person, eating locusts and honey, doing camel hair stuff, and out here baptizing a bunch of people? Who do you think you are? That's the question they're asking. Who are you? And their assumption is that in order for you to have this kind of authority, you must think that you're somebody. You must think that you might be the Messiah or a type of Messiah, a prophet or something along those lines. And so they ask him, are you the Messiah? The priests and Levites show up, big crowd of people. They're seeing what's going on, and that's what they ask. And here's what John says, John chapter 1, verse 20. It says, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. That's like a, the reason I went with this, this version, the, King James, the New King James, is because it's word for word. And when it says he confessed but did not deny but confessed, it's like this kind of emphasis, in my opinion, in the way he's writing it to say, like, there might be a temptation to accept a title that's not yours. Like, he, he, w- he was comfortable confessing, and he did not deny, and he confessed. Like, he, like there was a, a possibility that John could have left it loose, like that John could have just been like, listen, don't worry about what I'm doing. You can think what you want, right? That would be easy enough. If you're John the Baptist, you have crowds of people and there's this title that would give you all the authority you need. You don't, you don't even have to lie, right? Like all you have to say is like, I'm not saying I am the Messiah. All I am saying is that you haven't seen me and him in the same room. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to, you're not technically lying, but you might be leading the witness. You just let them think whatever they want to think so that you can have a certain amount of authority. But John's like, no, 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 he confessed. He didn't deny it. He confessed openly to say, I am not the Christ. Just to be clear, I'm not who you want me to be, and I will not accept a title. I will not accept the title that you're trying to lay upon me because what John in the gospel tells us is that he is a witness. And John is comfortable. John the Baptist is comfortable just being who he's called to be. He is comfortable just being a witness. He confessed. He didn't deny it, but went ahead and confessed. That's not who I am. I could let you think something. I could let you think I'm a Messiah. I could let you think I'm the Messiah. I could let you believe certain things about me that would make me look good. But you know what? Not worth it. I just, just to be clear, I'm just here to be a witness. I'm not him. I'm just, I'm just here for one purpose and one purpose only. So when we look at John's life and we ask these questions of how do we apply this to our life, like John the Baptist is comfortable in the background. He's comfortable not in the limelight. He's comfortable pointing the spotlight to somebody else. He's comfortable not being what everybody else wants him to be. And so the question that we want to wrestle with today, and one of the questions I want to ask you today to wrestle with is, are you comfortable not being who people want you to be? Are you comfortable not being who people want you to be? Are you okay just saying no to some people? Like, no, no, that's, that's not me. I'm so sorry. That's cool. No, no, most of us, when, that, when, that, when people want us to be a certain thing, we leave it loose. We leave it like, kind of like, ah, well, I mean, we, we dance around it. I'm not saying I'm a Messiah. All I'm saying is you haven't seen me and him in the same room. We leave it loose. Oh, you, you, you're done with that party life? I mean, just right now, I'm, I'm doing some things. I got to go to church tomorrow. No, no, like that's not, that's not me anymore. I don't need to be who you think I am, and I don't need your labels. I don't need, we, we like to leave it out there loose so that the title looks good on us. Are we comfortable just being in the background in moments and not living up to everybody else's expectation of ourselves because we know who God's called us to be? Because John the Baptist, in my opinion, is one of the greatest New Testament characters, like one of my favorites, like looking more into him, I'm realizing like he doesn't, he doesn't really miss the mark very often. Like there, there doesn't seem to be a spot in John's life where he misses it. Most of the New Testament characters miss it all the time over and over again, except for Jesus. And John seems to be one of the exceptions where he really continually is just okay in the background. He's just okay saying, you know what? I'm not here to be the Messiah. I'm here to point other people to the Messiah. I'm not here for the front of stage. I'm actually here for the background. I'm here for set design. I'm here to close the curtains. I'm here to do all the stuff to set the scene, to set the mode, to set the tempo, because I know who I am and I know who I'm not. And sometimes the greatest way to figure out who you are is to start to wrestle with and understand who you're not. I remember for me, the way that that played out, um, there was a moment uh, where a decision came my way that helped me decide who I was because it helped me clarify who I wasn't. 
uh, when I was in my 20s, early 20s before I was married, I worked the coolest job. It was the funnest job I've ever had. Um, I was technically a tour director by the IRS tax code. However, what I did was um, I worked for a company out of Texas that um, organized short-term missions, education, adventure trips for Christian schools and churches. So some of them would be mission trips, some would be education, some would be adventure. It just depended on the trip, like a senior trip for a Christian school, and we'd do one day of missions or a full mission trip with one day of adventure. It was a blast. Like Costa Rica, Ecuador, Puerto Rico, all these cool countries I was getting to travel to, and they were, like, they were actually paying me. I, didn't, like, I was like, I don't want to tell you. I would do it for free, but I didn't want to tell them that. Um, so I had this cool job, and it was, it was just, I would just get paid whenever I went. Like you just go, and you would go do the trip, and then you'd come home. They'd fly me home. It was all covered. It was just the coolest job. Um, and then, um, I stepped down from the church I was in and I was kind of in between churches and they, I was like, Hey, you're, are you free now? Like, would you be interested in a, in a more permanent job? And I was like, Ooh, what's that, what's that look like? So what the job would be, it'd be coordinating the trips behind the scenes and leading the trips whenever I wanted to. And as the coordinator, I could do whatever I want, whenever I wanted. So I could take as many trips as I wanted to take. And I was like, that, that sounds pretty cool. I mean, it looks cool on social media too. I don't know if you know that or not. Like you look like, yeah, I just, I'll just be traveling all the time. Like you see me in Europe, you'll see me in South America. It's no big deal. No big deal. I'm just, just doing my job. You know what I'm saying? Like you can look pretty cool. You can have a pretty cool perception, a pretty cool title. And in that moment I had to wrestle with, am I called to that? It sounds good. It looks good. It seems like it would be a blast, but is it who I am? And is it who I'm supposed to be? And in that moment I realized like, I, I have to say no. I don't have a job. Like I'm working several different jobs at the time just to pay the bills, but I don't actually have like a full-time ministry job. And this would fulfill that role as ministry because we'd be working with these churches, we'd do a mission trip, it was going to be perfect. And yet I knew I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't take this job because of what my passion was, who God had called me to be was, was a part of the local church. Like I needed in me to see the local church thrive. I believed that the local church is essential, the people coming to know Jesus and growing in Jesus. And I knew I couldn't abandon that. And so because I couldn't abandon that, I knew what I couldn't do because it helped me clarify who I was. Because I knew who I was, it helped me clarify who I wasn't. And that's not who I was. That's not what I could do. Nothing wrong with it. There's a bunch of people that are called to it. It's an awesome ministry. And I've gone back and taken a trip or two with them since then. But it's a great ministry. It just wasn't me. It wasn't my calling. There's nothing wrong with the thing that I could have done. It just wasn't me. And sometimes the hardest part of realizing who we are is realizing all the things we have to say no to. Because the no's help us reflect who we are. I don't do that. I can't do that. I can't go there. And I'm not talking about sin, right? You're living in sin. Scripture's clear. Get that out of your life. Stop it. It'll hurt you. God doesn't like it because it's going to destroy your life and your family's life. So get sin out. We're talking about just good things. Things that you, you might be called to. Things that, that, that other people might be called to, but you're not. Things that you could do in a season, but now you're in a different season. You can't do them anymore because you realize who you are. And it helps you realize who you're not. One of the filters that I'll give you if you're wrestling through some of these things, one of the filters that I ran that through and helped me process that understanding of who I'm not is I tried to look at my life in 20 years. Have a conversation with God. There was prayer. There was fasting. And in conversation with God, I was like, in 20 years, I wake up and I'm doing this job. Am I proud of who I am and what I'm doing? Like, did I leave something on the table? Do I look back with regret? Like, I have this conversation with God. Another way to phrase it is at the end of my life, if I have to look Jesus in the face and say, that's what I did with my life, am I proud of it? Am I proud that I made that decision? For some of you, am I proud that I took that promotion? Am I proud that I moved to that different town? Am I proud of the next choice that I made? Am I proud of, that, I, that I followed God in that moment and it helped me filter all the things that I was not supposed to do? They weren't bad. They weren't wrong. They weren't sin. They were fantastic. They were beautiful things to do. And yet, because I realized I would look back and know that I missed out on all God called me to do, I couldn't do it. That was my no. The second way I filtered, and this is more to filter who I am, um, is understanding scripture and having it inundate my heart. Like, Knowing who you are is found in who Jesus calls you to be. And you start to get a distinguishing voice when you, when, you listen, when you read scripture. When you understand what scripture says about you, you start to distinguish the voice of God and what he sounds like. The more time you spend with somebody, the better you are at hearing their voice. So there were sermons, there was scripture, there was moments alone with God that helped me understand his voice and what he was calling out in me. And those were the two things. Understanding what I couldn't do and understanding who I was were two things that helped me filter who I am, and what I'm not called to do so that I could be all that God had called me to be. See, for John the Baptist, 
uh, it would seem like that would be enough. It seems like that would be enough for them to, uh, them to just hear, like, that's not me, and they would go away. But that's not how it works in the world. You, you'll get a lot of opportunities to say no. I don't know if you noticed this. Uh, in your life, when you decide you're called to do something, all of a sudden, all the other opportunities show up right? Like you, you ain't had nobody call you up in forever to offer you this, this business opportunity. Like, hey, you got this new job? Well, just yesterday I told God I wouldn't take that job. That's weird. Just yesterday I told God I was going to diminish down the things that I was supposed to do. Just yesterday I decided that I was going to stay single for a while until I got healthy. And all of a sudden someone's calling on you. Someone's in your DMs, if you will. Someone's hollering at you and you realize, oh, I got to say no, because just yesterday I talked to God. I found out who I was, who I was called to be, and it helped me clarify what I couldn't do. And it keeps coming. So for John, here's the same thing. John the Baptist, here's the same thing. He, get, he gets the like, well, okay, maybe you're not the Christ, the Messiah, but they had an idea of other forerunners, of other little messiahs that weren't the Messiah, but little messiahs. The Jewish culture had this idea of like an, an Elijah that was supposed to come, a prophet that was supposed to come. So they're like, okay, maybe you're not him, but what if you're like, but, but are you Elijah? Or are you the prophet? And the crazy thing about John the Baptist in that moment is he could technically have enough wiggle room to say he was Elijah. Jesus calls him the Elijah. Like Jesus refers to him in Matthew as the Elijah, the forerunner to, to clear the path for him. He is the Elijah. And yet John the Baptist doesn't label himself as the Elijah. He's like, no, 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 that's, that's not me. I'm not him. Now, I don't know, there's a little bit of debate, all right? We can nerd out on this. It was taking us way too long. There's a little bit of debate. Did John know that he was Elijah and understood what they wanted from him? Or did he not yet know who he was? I would argue that he knew exactly who he was. I would argue that he knew that he was the forerunner that Jesus was speaking of, but he wasn't what they were wanting him to be. The way that they asked the question, are you the Elijah? Are you him? He knew I can't fit your label of what you're expecting of me. So I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to make you confused and make you put labels on me that aren't me. So when I, when he says, I'm not the Elijah, he's saying, I'm not what you want me to be. And then he answers them. This is who I am. Let me clarify in John chapter one, verse 23, John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. John's identification of himself is to say, no, no, no I just, I have a, I just got one job. I'm preparing the way for him. I'm, I'm just the witness. I'm just the set designer. I'm just here to make sure things go smoothly. I'm just here clearing the path for the Messiah. Don't put it on me. Don't put labels on me that aren't me. I'm not, the, I'm not who you want me to be. I'm comfortable in who God has called me to be. And it's enough for me to be the John the Baptist that God has called me to be, to just clear the path for the one who is to just clear the path, just make straight. I don't need the limelight. I don't need the show. I tried to come out into the wilderness so that y'all could leave me alone. Y'all can do your temple thing. Y'all can do your Pharisee thing. Y'all can do your Levite thing because I'm out here doing what God has called me to be. He didn't go, he didn't go cause stirring up trouble. He was just trying to be who God had called him to be and they came to him. Isn't that how it works? You're just trying to mind your own business. Just trying to do what God's called you to do. And all of a sudden the temptations of titles and expectations and what everybody else wants you to be. And John is saying, no, no, I, I only want to be what God has called me to be. The temptation doesn't stop there because then the Pharisees show up and they want to know like, all right, but then, but then why do you have the authority to do it? Like who, who, listen, we baptize a certain way. You're out here in the wilderness. And this is my context. This is not actually in John one, but I, my context is this is what you're supposed to do. This is what tradition says you're supposed to do. This is, you're supposed to wear a suit and tie when you preach, or you're supposed to wear a robe when you preach. You're supposed to do this when you preach. You're supposed to only get saved inside the building of the church, not out in the streets. There's all of these expectations that religion will place on you. And the Pharisees are saying, this is where we baptize. What do you think you're doing? How do you have the authority? And here's what John replies in John uh, 1, 26 and 27. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. <laughs> he takes the back seat again. Like, I'm just, I'm just dunking people, okay? Like, what I'm doing is nothing. Like, y'all haven't seen anything yet. Like, I, I, I'm, on, I'm on a low tier of what I'm doing. I'm just putting people underwater and letting them come back out. That's it. It's as simple as that. We're out here giving baths. That's all we're doing. And you got, you've got to come to me and ask me questions of who I am. No, no, no. I'm just the beginning stage of what is about to come. Don't look at me. I'm just designing the set. 
Don't look at me. I'm just baptizing, but there is somebody coming that I need you to put the spotlight on. Someone that isn't me, that isn't the, the expectations of what you want of me. It isn't me. And he keeps pushing himself to the background. And the challenge today is for us to be comfortable like John in the background. To be comfortable with every area of our life, looking like John's life, where all it is is a witness. All our life is is a reflection. All our life is is a preparation for what God can do. All our life is is to be a mirror so that people can actually see Jesus in us. Our job is to not look the best, seem the best, or sound the best. Our job is to be a witness and reflect the best. That's, that's what John is about. That's what John is saying. And I think that's a, a good testimony for the rest of us to say, you know what, I don't, I, don't, I don't want the spotlight. Like the more the world tries to put the spotlight, the more the world tries to see you and tell you how good you are, the more you go, whoa, 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 whoa hold up. No, no, there wasn't. Um, let me tell you who I was. And let me tell you what God did in me to just be a witness. And I think the more you're comfortable Just being the witness, just being the background, just preparing the way, just having the conversation, not being perfect, not getting it all together, not not accepting the titles, but just saying, you know what? I don't don't need the attention because I'm trying to make way for the one who does need the attention. I'm trying to just be the witness for the one who deserves the attention, whose sandals I don't even have, I'm not even justified to untie his sandals. That's how holy he is. Because I'm just, I'm just in the background. I'm just setting the way. I just want to tell you a story. I just want to be a witness. The more you do that, the more I think you get to see, right? See, if you're, if you're in the foreground and you're getting all the attention, you can't see what's happening behind you. I mean, you're just, you got the, the light in your eyes right now. I barely see half your faces. Lights are in my eyes. You can't even see what's going on. I don't know what's happening. Y'all may, half of y'all are probably sleeping. I can't see. That's because I'm in the foreground. I step in the back. You step in the back and you can start to see a little bit differently. You can start to see the faces of people that are changing. You can see behind the scenes productions. You get revelation of things that are taking place before they even show up in front of everybody else. And that's what happens to John. John, in the background, gets to see something that nobody else sees. Not not even all three years of his ministry. John's at the beginning of his ministry, and John sees it before everybody else. Here's what happens in uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How did John know that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? That seems like a very simple concept for us because we read the end of the book, right? Some of us have seen the end of the gospel. We know that he's a sacrificial lamb for our sins, and we know that he takes away the sins of the world. John's perception, his, his Jewish mindset is not anything of the sort. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know where John gets this other than a direct revelation from God himself, that he gets to see something nobody else sees because there's not really, from what I can tell, there's not really much in the Old Testament to indicate the Messiah should be a lamb. I don't really see very many indications. If it is, it's very vague. It's hard to grasp and understand. What do you mean by lamb? It, to, to see the Messiah as a sacrificial offering for sin, I don't know. I don't know. Where, that doesn't really show up too much. It's hard to read until you read it after the fact, especially sh- so whenever he says he takes away the sin of the world. Peter, who is following Jesus for all three years of his ministry, still doesn't grasp this truth. Peter still thinks that Jesus is about the Jewish people, that Jesus is here to save the house of Israel. And John already has a revelation that Jesus takes away the sin of not just some, not just a few, but the whole world. John, behind the scenes, John the Baptist, behind the scenes, gets a revelation of things that nobody else gets, that they don't grasp. And that's what I think happens. I think the more that you're okay in the background, the more you're okay being a witness, the more you get to see your family changed the more you get a revelation on what your loved ones need to hear, the more you get a revelation on the things that would lead your family in a healthy direction, the more you get an understanding of what it would look like to help your kids become passionate followers of Jesus, the more you get an understanding of what it would look like to lead your cousin, your brother, your sister, your grandma to understand who Jesus really is because you're okay in the background. And I believe in those moments, God reveals things to you that you don't get in the foreground. You don't get when you need the spotlight. You don't get when you need the titles, when you need something that you can just be comfortable stepping back in the background. John says this in verse 31. He says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Here's what I did. I wasn't even sure the whole picture yet. I just knew my part. John says, I didn't even know him. 
until this very moment. And what it says is that the, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and it revealed it to him. And John says, I didn't know who it was. I was in the background and I wasn't sure how my part was going to play with the rest of it. I just knew my part. I didn't get the full script. I didn't get the whole thing. I didn't get the whole show. All I know is that someone gave me my part and his name was God. And I showed up and I did my part and then God revealed it to me. Then I got to see the end of the production. Then I got to see the revelation of what it was because I played the part that God had for me. I got to see more than everybody else. I didn't, I didn't need the spotlight. I was okay in the background. You know what's absurd about this? He didn't know who he was. Jesus is John's cousin. Like he didn't, what do you mean you didn't know who he was? You didn't know who your cousin was? Like this is, Jewish culture is very family oriented. The idea that he had never met Jesus before is kind of absurd. He almost had to have met Jesus before. But even in meeting his own cousin, he didn't know who he really was. And it wasn't revealed to him until that very moment. Because over and over and over again, John said, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. And then God dropped revelation. Like, cool. Now I can show you some things. Now you're ready to be the witness that I've called you to be. Now you can be everything that I've designed you to be because you're comfortable in the background. I can give you foreground knowledge. Here's what John says about himself in verse 34. He said, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. I have seen, see, when John concludes all that he's telling, when John the Baptist tells what he's seen, he no longer labels himself as just the forerunner but now he's just a witness. You know, it's kind of a, a sandwich taking place where the gospel of John describes him as a witness three times. And then John the Baptist finally describes himself as a witness. Like I, I, I've seen and I've borne witness as the son of God. Again, more revelation. How, how you know he's the son of God, that's blasphemous in his culture. It's, it's revelation that nobody has just yet, that nobody understands about him. He gets to see things that nobody else sees because he's comfortable in the background. And today, my prayer is that you are comfortable just being a witness, that you are comfortable in the background of the production that is the gospel, that you're comfortable in the background of the good news of what Jesus is going to do in your family if you'll just trust who he's called you to be. You just take a step back. Like it's not about what I get out of it. It's not about all the titles and the perception, but it really is just about reflecting and pointing people back to Jesus, that I'm comfortable with no titles, there's, a, there's an old quote of, of a guy named Zig Ziglar that you can have anything you want in your life as long as you don't care who gets credit. I'll, I'll take it a step further and I would say you can have anything you want in your life as long as you let him get the credit. I, I think there's things that you wanted in your life and you want for your family. You've been praying for your kids and your titles and your perception and your own ideas of what you deserve in life are getting in the way. I believe God wants to reveal some things to you about how to lead your family, how to love your, your family and your loved ones, how to forgive people well. I think God wants to do some things in you. And he's waiting on you to be able to take a step back and say, oh, it's, it's, not, a, it's not about me. It's not about me getting the credit for leading my family. It's about me being a witness to what you can do in them. It's about me being a witness for what you've done in me. I think all that God has ever called us to do is bear witness is to just be a witness for what God has done in us. Every single one of us. Like, I don't think you're called because you have a ministry degree or you go to seminary. I don't think you're called because you've been in church a long period of time. When you decide to follow Jesus, I think at that moment, he just says, just be a witness. Just tell like, hey, this is who I was and this is what God did in me. That's enough. And you can grow and learn as much as you can about scripture and who God has called you to be so you can be a better witness. That's all we're ever striving to do is to be a better reflection of Jesus with our life, to step more and more into the background. This word witness that we've been using over and over again is the root word is the word we use for martyr. Like originally it wasn't intended to be what martyr is today. Like a martyr today is someone who dies for their faith. But the word that we stole it from, the word that we used and attached the label to die for your faith happened to be the same word for witness. So when they started talking about martyrs for their faith, all they were saying was witnesses for their faith. They were just witnesses and it got them killed. They just testified to what God had done in them. They just said, listen, I don't, I, I don't know about your religion, but I know that the son of God met me where I was at and he changed me. And if he can change me, he can change the world. All I know is that I, I was one way and then I met Jesus and then I was another way. That's it. That's all your testimony has to be. That's all the testimony in the courtroom is. I, I don't have to know all the apologetics. I don't have to have, the, have all the answers. I can say I don't know. 
But what I do know is that I was one way. I met Jesus and now I'm a different way. That's sufficient. All of us just called to be a witness. And the thing about this word and the idea of witness is it does take us to die a little bit each time. Each moment we decide to set down our pride, set down our title, set down our expectations and just play the background. We have to die a little bit. We have to, scripture says, and Jesus tells us, we, we die to ourselves daily. That's the process of death he's talking about. Just die to yourself daily. Like, it's just not about me. It's not about the show. It's not about the attention. It's not about what everybody thinks about me. It's about what everybody thinks about Jesus. And I'll play the background. I'll, I'll, I'll point people to Jesus. I'll, I'll open the curtains for him. I will set the, and design the stage work so that people can see him more clearly because it's not about me or my titles or what I deserve or what I think God owes me. It is about what he did in me and letting everybody else know what he did. And over and over again, you have these moments where God is saying, no, no, I just need you to be a witness. I just need you to tell them. I just need you to tell your story. I just need you to be a witness for me. And sometimes we have trouble dying to our expectations and what we wish would happen. We've got to say, yeah, if you'll trust me, I'll reveal more to you and show you more good things than you could ever imagine. There was a moment this week I was listening to um, somebody who was a pastor, had been a pastor and was just doing podcasts now. And he talked about a moment that he was frustrated. And at the moment that he was frustrated it was because he uh, went to a Super Bowl party and he was the only Christian at the Super Party, only believer in Jesus at the Super, Par- Super Bowl party. And a commercial comes on. Maybe some of you saw the commercial. Um, it was a commercial. And then at the end of it, kind of like surprise twist, M. Night Shyamalan twist ending. It was about Jesus. Like you didn't see it coming. It was a Jesus commercial. And he was kind of embarrassed by the commercial. Like, oh, it's kind of cheesy. And my friends were confused. And I'm just trying to, there, I'm just there trying to watch a game. And his friends all kind of look at him like, What's this about? Who's the, what's this Jesus thing about? And he's super annoyed. He's like, is that really what we should be doing with our money for the Super Bowl? He's super annoyed. Is that really helpful? They, didn't, they, they, they just wanted to watch the game. And I listened to that and I thought, all I saw was an opportunity for you to witness. All I saw was an opportunity for a group of people, no matter how confused they were, no matter how good the commercial or bad the commercial was, was an opportunity for you to go, oh, that guy, let me tell you about what he did in me. Simple as that, like, let, let me tell you about who I was and what I believe Jesus has done in me. And there's so many moments just like that where it's frustrating, like, ah, oh, I got a flat tire. Oh, the, the, the person in front of me is taking too long. Ah, oh, this isn't going right. I'm, I'm stuck at this job longer than I wanted to be. And God is like, no, no, I set you there to be a witness. The person helping you change your tire, the person that delayed just a little bit at Homeland, the person who just delayed you a little bit at Walmart, the person who is annoying you was actually the person you were supposed to be a witness to. You were just supposed to reflect my goodness in your life. And maybe they see your patience. Maybe they see your kindness. Maybe they see something in you that opens the door for you to just be a witness. And so my prayer for you today is that you're okay just playing the background. That you just get comfortable reflecting Jesus to other people around you with everything that you do, everything that you are. And that this week, you look for opportunities to be a witness. That if you really believe Jesus is who he says he is and he's designed you on purpose for a purpose, that you go, you know what? Things aren't happening on accident. God is setting me up for opportunities. And I'll play the background. I'll open the curtain. I'll set the stage design. I'll give him the spotlight. Let's pray.